start, and and welcome to uh, Free Hands Friday. Today is March fourteenth, two thousand fourteen. My name is Jim Riley, and I'm I'm sitting in my basement in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and we got oh, it looks like half a dozen or so people on the on the chat thing down below. Uh, and the focus, the one that I have up on my big screen, is Dan Chapman. Um, say hi, Dan. Hello. Hello. I'm Dan Chapman. Uh, Dan is is a good friend of mine, and um, I like to to consider him a bit of a co-conspirator. We've got similar interests that we've gone back and forth with over the years. Uh, and our our chat today, our, the focus of our discussion is Dan's documentary um, that's that's been in progress for for a while now. And I guess we'll we'll get to that a little bit later. He says um, with a sigh. With a sigh. With a heavy sigh. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that. I think uh, the, the most I guess interesting and, and unique thing for me in terms of, of Dan as a as a documentary filmmaker is his his role in the whole process, which we'll totally get into and talk about that and uh, and and go from there. But there's really you know nobody that's that's better poised to um, to tell the story Dan has to tell than Dan himself. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, ask him to tell us a little bit about himself. Um, what he does, who he is, and the project that he's working on. Thank you, Jim. Uh, well, I am uh, Emmett's brother, and uh, so I know a little bit about what he's done and the invention that he's made. Um, also, uh, what I do is I started out as a musician, and dropped out of music school and became uh, an artist and I'm a graphic artist. Uh, I've been involved in almost all the projects uh, for Stick Enterprises. I was there uh, from the beginning. As a matter of fact, on my wall I just noticed I have a, uh, hang on, I have one of the first, uh, first sketches that I did of the Stick Man. Yeah, this is on an old faded brown piece of paper, but uh, it was inspired by Milton Glaser, who did a, a book cover that uh, of an image similar to this. But uh, I took it and ran with it, and uh, came up with that logo for Emmett. And that's kind of what I do. What I do is is make uh, movie posters now. I came, I went from publishing to album covers and finally wound up doing uh, film posters. Cool. Tell us about the, the documentary and uh, maybe just a quick introduction and then I think you've got some stuff queued up to play, some little clips from it? Yes. Okay, so give us a, oh, yeah, give us a quick introduction and then give us a, like a little taste of it and then we'll come back and maybe look at some specific things okay. uh, involved in that. Yeah, uh, well, it's a docu in progress, I call it, uh, because it's not finished yet. Uh, it's uh, it's not a movie yet, uh, and I'll tell you why later, but uh, there's a lot of elements that are a movie. I've shot about 170 hours of footage. I've been working on it for 10, hour, uh, 10 years. 10 hours. It's been a fast process. No, I've been <laughs> working on it for 10 years, and... And uh, most documentaries take about seven years to complete, so I'm not too far behind the average. But uh, it's a, a personal documentary, and it follows an evolutionary pattern that's happening as we speak. In fact, a lot of really interesting things have been happening that uh, are almost like a perfect ending to the documentary. So uh, let me show you. I'm going to put... I'm going to go to show you my screen and show a couple of uh, clips. We'll, we can talk about it. Cool. Hang on. Cool. Oh. All right. I showed a 20-minute clip at a documentary 
group just recently. And here's how it starts. So that's uh, uh, the beginning for now, yeah. um, and here's uh, I'll jump to I'll jump to some part. Here's uh, Emmett when he presents it to uh, what's my line in uh, 1984. Uh, wait. What was that? Nineteen? No, this is 75? 74 maybe. Yeah. Right after he started his, I think it's seventy four. Right after he started his business. Yeah. Yeah. This is a Chapman stick. People are absolutely blown away when they hear it. I watch the audience looking over there. Like I joke around about. I know what it would like. What it's like to be in a room with Angelina Jolie. All eyes will be over there on her. They're not watching me. Everybody's watching this, the guy who's playing that strange instrument. I'm Emmett Chapman. I'm the originator and inventor of this instrument that I'm holding. It's called the stick. It's just a piece of wood, and it's got ten strings on it. And you play it by tapping. You know, this is a real challenge now in terms of what to say about the stick because it's been around for 30 plus years, right? All right. So, how do I get back to, let's see. There you go. All right. Nice. Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to see a couple of little clips. Um, what do you think? So, uh, <laughs> well, I've, I've seen it before, and I've seen it lots, and, and, and I think you know, you know what I think, but let me ask you a couple of questions. So um, the, the first question is, what's, what's the story? Sum up, sum up the story that you're telling in this documentary as clearly and concisely as you can. Well, Emmett created uh, a new way of playing music. He was discovering, he was experimenting on a guitar and was searching for something. He was uh, a very, uh, 
he played a very restrictive type of music with uh, a, a traditional jazz. He came up uh, with a musical background and uh, became a, a jazz player and was blown away when he saw Jimi Hendrix in 1968, 69, and he had to find his freedom uh, through guitar and realized that uh, you know he he wanted to be a shredder and so he discovered this technique uh, on August 26 1969 at a time where uh, the ethic of the day was to do your own thing and as a child Emmett was a role model for me, and he was someone who um, who I looked up to as an independent thinker. And so I uh, decided to make a documentary about this. And and he's um, he created an instrument. I, I mean, this is not a an elevator pitch by any means, but uh, he created a, an instrument uh, for his own freedom, and uh, he had to make a choice. Uh, and let me let me uh, play you another clip that kind of illustrates what that choice was. Sure. Hang on one second. Yeah. So while you're queuing that up, I want to throw an idea out there. Sure. And I've all, from from my talking with Emmett and and my talking with you and such, it always I always revolve back to the idea that Emmett has created his own universe, and he did that when he was a kid, like literally right from the very very beginning. He's created his own reality. Um, and, and I see what he's done with, with uh, first the technique and then the instrument, an extension of that. Um, what do you think about that as an idea? The, uh, of creating his own, yeah, sure. He's, creating uh, his own reality. Yeah, uniqueness sure. and originality was really important for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, uh, that's what I was talking about. The ethic of doing your own thing, yeah. and and the ethic also of freedom, uh, in the '60s, uh, yeah. freedom was a very important word, and he the, his first instrument was called uh, the freedom guitar. Oh yeah! Before you start that clip, talk about talk about the fact that you were there when he started it. So for those you know who don't know the story, Emmett's quite a bit older than Dan, and he would come back. Emmett was in the Air Force at the time, and he would come back and he would visit the family. Uh, and he'd hang out with Dan, who was playing in a band at the time called Vanilla Rain, which turned into a band called Cotton. Uh, and Vanilla Rain, Dan's being modest, but Vanilla Rain was the Beatles of, of their high school. Uh, and if we have time, I'll throw a picture up. Uh, and anyway, so he was, Emma would come back, and, and he would be hanging out with these hippies, basically, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And Dan was, or sorry, Emmett was, he wasn't a, a straight-laced army guy, but he was, a, you know, he was an Air Force guy. He had the short hair, he was... He was an officer in the Air Force, and he would come back on weekends and hang out and, and play rock and roll with Dan and his, uh, his crazy hippie friends. So talk a little bit about that, and, and that's kind of the, the um, fire that the, the technique came out of, uh, at, which led to the... Right. Okay, well, here's, here's a picture of Emmett uh, at the time that he discovered this technique. Sick. And, and that so is... What? What? What's the question? Oh, talk about talk about that Genesis idea that um, that that time frame that was going on. So Emmett's coming back and, and jamming with you and Fred and and um, and those guys. Tell me about those times. Tell me about what that was like. Right. Well, it was uh, the '60s, and yeah, and that was a time of uh, of uh, of of freedom of. Uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, this this is the Newport uh, 1969 poster for uh, the Devonshire Downs uh, Woodstock that happened in Northridge, California, where we lived. We lived in uh, Granada Hills and Woodland Hills, which was very close. And we had just uh, graduated from high school and went to this concert, which was the largest outdoor concert ever before Woodstock. It happened about a month before Woodstock. Yeah, if I remember correctly, you told me a story about listening to the sound check while they were, uh, while you're sitting on your high school steps, you could hear the sound check. Yeah, we were, going, we were going through our trial run with cap and gowns on and we could hear sound check 
uh, for that weekend's uh, festival or Friday night, starting Friday night, and we all went to uh, to the festival. And uh, they they made a law against having a festival like that uh, after that happened, and and that could no longer uh, take place. Hmm. But from- anyway, uh, so so the the effect, uh, what would what happened in those days? Um, you know, we were we were a band. We were playing music together. I had just graduated, and we decided to uh, give up our pop band. We wanted to be a cool, uh, you know, we wanted to be serious musicians. And we were listening to Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Jimi Hendrix, Clapton, uh, Santana, The Cream, um, and and Fred, our guitarist, was. Uh, Hang on, hang on one second. Uh, yeah, Fred was a huge inspiration to Emmett. Fred was, uh, he was like the Jimi Hendrix of the day and, and really could, could play with that, with that style and with that power. Yeah, he was practicing uh, all day. We, were, yeah. we just graduated from high school, so we didn't have anything else to do. Yeah. So he, Fred was like practicing 10, 12 hours a day, and he, he was obsessed to play the guitar, to be like, he was channeling Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And uh, Emmett was a great admirer of of Fred and his playing, and he uh, and en- ended up taking in Fred. Fred uh, got kicked out of his house by his dad for having long hair. His hair was down to his shoulders, and uh, his dad kicked him out. So Emmett and his family took him in, and he slept on their couch for a while. Yeah. And they would jam at night and play music together. And he was basically playing this very fluid technique. In fact, um, let me play you something that um, kind of explains what I'm talking about. Yeah. And also the times. I know you're asking about it. So it's a little difficult to negotiate these Google, uh, this Google uh, way of doing this. Hang on one second. So let, let me, me know what... Let me know when you got that up, Dan. Yeah, please. Uh, and in the meantime, so it, it was like, so when the, the, the genesis of the stick, it was like this combination of the, the free-flowing 60s with this analytical jazz mind. And that was Emmett's thing. He was in both worlds at the same time, but really neither of them. You know, so he had, he had a foot firmly in each. And if you put that on the instrument, his, his right hand, which for me, I don't know if you can see my fingers moving, or my left hand, which is, which is broken at this point, um, but anyways, Emmett's left hand was that that analytical jazz chords, that that progression, and the right hand was just free flowing, you know, fire electric guitar. And it's that technique that came together on the instrument, the the freedom guitar that he created. Okay, which, let me play let me play this segment. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is on my screen. Uh, it it sort of explains that period of time a little bit. Us uh, supporting that vision. He was following this sound. Is how I saw it. He was like. Looking for it. When I look back at it now, I can see it better than when I was in it because he was just playing all the time, playing all the time, changing his guitar, adding strings, changing the tuning. He was looking for something, you know? And I think when he did the tapping thing that day, and I remember the day because he went, yeehaw! He literally said that. I was playing guitar. I was in the middle of this room. I'd been listening to Jimi Hendrix. It was 1969. I had been a very ambitious jazz guitarist, but I wanted to play more like jazz piano players, like Mark Tatum, Oscar Peterson, McCoy Tyner. Then I heard Jimi Hendrix. drug music. Uh, it sounded like the most graceful, artful guitarist I'd ever heard singing. It was sustaining and it was it was a radar antenna for the acoustic feedback on the stage. And so by aiming your guitar you could 
you could control the harmonics that were coming through a sustained note. So I started turning up all my equipment. I had three wah-wah pedals like Jimi Hendrix. I put Vaseline all over the board of this instrument so I could slip and slide around on it. This was on, on the day, on that August 26th? This was leading up to it, like the week before. And uh, Vaseline? Vaseline, yeah. Just, just to be able to throw away all my jazz ideas and technique and just stand up and start playing. I put my right hand over the board and started doing what I was trying to do with my left hand, which was to play a note and hammer on and hammer off, hammer on and hammer off like this. But you didn't, you didn't have it upright or anything. I, no, I had it more horizontal. You were like playing guitar. See, this this uh, this is the first guitar freedom guitar I called it, and I converted. And I put a damper on it. I took off a gear shift, and I I converted it from horizontal like this to vertical by putting a strap around the back and a strap over my shoulder, and so it still fits pretty good. Feels a little tighter now, actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, that explains a little bit about how he discovered it. Yeah. yeah. And he, he changed overnight. He changed his, his music. He changed his music as a musician, but I think his personality also changed overnight as well. From from what he says. Um, yeah, he took a risk. He. Yeah. Stopped working, and he started manufacturing. Uh, no, he started building the instrument. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't decide to manufacture it until 1974. Yeah, it was four year or five year process from that to to 74. Trips to New York, various other things. Um, now, do you have some of the uh, some of his early music and such uh, in the documentary? I'm thinking specifically of the um, the Tim Buckley stuff, that sort of thing. Is any of that in the in the doc? Yeah. Uh, when I play something, some audio, does do I have to screen share it in order for you to hear it? Probably not. Let me play you something. See if you can hear this. Um, this is something. I think this is with him and Les De Merle, early playing. Yeah. The the point about Emmett it is that he wanted to be a shredder. Yeah, I know what you're going to play, and this is this is my favorite piece of music Emmett's ever recorded. If it's, well, let's, if it's the let's see if you thing, can hear it. One. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear it. Tell me if you can. If not, I'll I'll uh, go to screen share. Can you hear that? Yep. So we'll just listen to it. Yeah, and we can talk a little. Sure. So this is this is pre stick enterprises. This would have been about seventy two. Oh, this is not um, this is not the list of Merle. Can you sell it? This is a beautiful piece that he did for. Uh, I think it was a touchboard. Oh, a touchboard to circuit board. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's playing all right, right? The sound. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I thought that was very lyrical and beautiful, and magical. Yeah. Anyway, uh, do you have that? Do you have that thing handy for Les Demerle at the cellar? Yeah. Where he's just ripping it up. Yes. This is like I say. This is this is seventy two. Um, I think it's seventy two. It's around there. Uh, so this is kind of between the the technique discovery. And stick enterprises, and he's gone through. This would be his third um, prototype of the stick. So he had the freedom guitar first, and then the one with a. It's an ebony board with a box over top of the pickup, uh, and then the third one, which has the pickup mounted underneath, and basically looks like the stick as it does today. Uh, and he's playing with with Les Okay, here it is. Color. He was listening to John McLaughlin at the time, yeah. and he admired this very physical, fast technique. Yeah. 
and the only way he could play it was to create an instrument that would allow him to be free like that. Can you hear that okay? Yeah, it's not great, but I think we get the gist of it. The, the audio is very hard to, to hear. Is it? Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. an old recording. It's a it's yeah. real to real. Yeah, I would say uh, it's hard to hear. It's, it's pretty hard to hear. Okay. That's too bad. I guess what what I like most about that is it's it's totally formed, right? Like it's 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 fully developed. The technique, the the phrasing, everything is is really really fully fully developed. And it's only three years old. It's you know three years of of playing the instrument. Um, yeah, it was a concept. Yeah. When he, when he like his daughter was saying, she was in the next room, and he was jumping around the room when he hit upon it. Yeah. And it was a total concept. He was yeah. not. Uh, I mean, it was. It, he realized there was a path laid out to him that he knew he would take, yeah. and it, it involved creating an instrument that uh, embodied the technique that was yeah. in his mind. And nobody yeah. had played played like that. I mean, we kind of take it for granted now. Uh, and one of the interesting things is, at the time, uh, people didn't realize what they were hearing when they heard it. Uh, it, because it sounded, it's sort of like a one-man band uh, concept. Yeah. Let me let me show you something while I'm uh, explaining that. It's. Let's see about this. Um, Emmett, uh, one of the reasons I, I just realized that he was. He was an accordion player. Yeah. <laughs> this is him with his uh, three brothers. Emmett's uh, 15 years older than I am, and that's Ronnie and Jerry. They didn't really play instruments at the time. They were kind of just posing. Yeah. But uh, Emmett was uh, very serious about playing the accordion. Yeah. Uh, in fact, here's uh, a little clip of him playing uh, for our family. We used to have these musical... Uh, gatherings. Can you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Emma's playing according there. Yeah. That's your mom singing too. Yeah, that's my mom. This is 1948. Uh, by the way, you know, this is kind of jumping all over the place, but yeah. uh, I just kind of have to talk about these things as I see them. Yeah. Uh, this is Emmett's father. Emmett and I have different uh, biological fathers, and uh, my mother uh, fell in love with him when he was a uh, traveling evangelist. He used to go from city to city preaching uh, the word of God, <laughs> and he uh, she fell in love with him. In those days, there was no television, uh, and and there was no, the 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 main source of entertainment uh, in the world was uh, circuses and traveling performances and stuff. So you know he was he was a fiery uh, breathe. He was a he he had a flock, uh, and he had people who would follow him uh, in his sermons. And it was kind of an interesting dynamic history of the way they met. Yeah, that's Emmett, Emmett Pardee. And that's my mom, and she yeah. was a performer. She played in clubs. The the thing, the story is that she crashed every club on Rush Street in Chicago where she lived. She would yeah. just walk into the clubs and start playing, which uh, takes a bit of balls, I think. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's, that's her and Emmett. 
Yeah. He was born in uh, Santa Barbara. That's uh, Emmett and the, his daughters. Um, let's see. Freehands. Uh, this is the first design of the Freehands uh, booklet, which uh, was in, done in 1974. And we, this is the first design of uh, an ad that we put out. I think it was in Guitar Player or something like that. And freedom of expression. That was like a key key message. This is Fred, me, Utah, and Emmett <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking up at the time, Dan, and I'm thinking uh, we, let's get back to the... Oh, that, there's a good story about this one, too, though, before you go off this one. Okay. That yeah. picture. So, this is so Emmett. Uh, yeah. My mom had married a, another guy, and uh, he had a, a egg farm, <laughs> and and Emmett was uh, had to work. He was treating. He was very strict disciplinarian, uh, and he he told Emmett that he had to work as long as he was wearing these pants. Yeah. And they they were his work pants. I'm not sure if these were the pants that were the. Yeah, I don't know, but that's how he tells the story. So he's he's telling the story. Emmett's telling the story, and and his daughter Diane is there, and is saying, you know, I'm, I wasn't allowed to, to do anything but work in these pants. And Diana looks at the pants and says, well, Daddy, you're, you're sitting down. <laughs> yeah, so therefore, I don't think, <laughs> yeah, I don't think these were the work pants. <laughs> I think he actually had work pants. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so go ahead. Let's, let's get back to the doc, the doc real quick, just because our time is, is disappearing okay. really, really quick. Um, so it's a documentary in progress, in process, um, where is it in the process, and where is it? Where is it going? Where are we at in that in that process? Uh, I cr I completed a a 42 minute clip for a festival in Ventura in 2010, yeah. and I've been modifying that. I played uh, a developed version of that uh, at the Freehands Festival last yeah. year in August, um, and I've I've been polishing it as I go. Yeah. But um, it's I really need collaboration. I I have go, taken it. I've shot 170 hours of film uh, of footage, and uh, the story is is an important one. Yeah. Uh, but it's something something I really uh, could use could use help with. It's yeah. uh, it, you know I've been working on it for 10 years. And it's uh, let's see what's going on with this headphones. I guess I don't need the headphones. I uh, I've put a lot of myself into it, of my time and editing and shooting and developing the story. Uh, but it's hard to beat collaboration when you're making a sure. film. And so uh, I played it uh, for the. Uh, Freehands Academy in August, and there were three producers there mm -hmm. who were uh, were interested, and they are all, all on the board of the International Documentary Association here in Los Angeles. Uh, they had a lot of advice and notes for me, yeah. and one of the things uh, they mentioned was to broaden it. Instead of making it a documentary about Emmett by himself, mm -hmm. to add other characters and have other players, which has really been on my mind since I started. Yeah, uh, It would be great to feature a couple of other players, two or three, in different parts of the world, but, you know, that takes uh, expense and travel and stuff like that. I, I called, I asked Tony Levin for an uh, introduction to uh, Peter Gabriel, yeah. and I uh, was in uh, correspondence with him in his offices. His secretary told me that... Uh, he would record something, and you, that we could use for the documentary. Yeah. So that's one thing. I need other other people would be great, um, but funding is critical. And and unfortunately, I'm you know busy with with work, and yeah. it's it's hard to mount a funding campaign. I mean, that takes a lot of effort. I'm not the best salesperson on the phone, and. I, it's one of the things I dislike the most is give, making calls and you know begging for stuff and and basically that's what you have to do when you're right. when you're seeking uh, 
uh, to get funded. Right. Now, people have told me to do the the uh, this this the uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. Yep. And, and of course, that is on the agenda, but. Um, that also takes a lot of energy. You have to mount a campaign. You have to come up with gifts and things to to give people, and uh, uh, it it takes a lot of time over a period a period of a month or two yeah. to do that. I have I have friends. One of the producers who showed up was uh, an expert at crowdsourcing, yeah. and, and did that for a movie that I worked on, uh, and raised uh, forty thousand dollars, which was wow. pretty yeah. Uh, so yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things in the works and a lot of opportunity, a lot of new things happening, including the Free Hands Academy, which is, has been a wonderful thing that uh, Gene has put together. Yep. And, it's a, and actually, where I'm at now is that I haven't, I haven't developed the editing on the film for a couple of years, uh, and I, where I stopped is where Emmett was in a period of frustration yeah. by working 40 years um, making the instruments by hand. I, I yeah. mean, he had to finish every single instrument uh, on his own. Uh, he has people working with him, but he had to go through the last setups on each instrument. And it was uh, something that kept him completely tied to the manufacturing process. Yeah. And uh, the, the newest development has been the rail board, which is something he created uh, that has essentially um, uh, designed himself out of the equation yeah. and, and provided uh, a legacy, a way that an instrument can be made uh, with a, you know, without him being around even. And, yeah. and actually, here's, here's something that... Um, that I that we made that starts to touch on that. Yeah. So that whole idea of, of freeing his hands. So the rail board now is has freed his hands. So it's the the quickest route to free hands the technique, but also freed his hands to do other things. Yeah. The irony of the story is that he created an instrument for his own freedom of playing. Yeah. Other people started wanting it, and uh, that he made this choice, and he in a sense, became a slave to the manufacturing process. And, w of course, he played, but was not this free shredder that he wanted to be. Yeah. So uh, here's, here's the last part of uh, a, a piece we did for the rail board that kind of touches on it. <laughs> inspiration was out of pain and hard work. It's like years and years and years of uh, setting up instruments and, and doing fret work laboriously like a jeweler. I got involved in the finest kind of fret work and clearances above each fret so that um, the setup would be as low as possible, the action as light as possible, the touch is light, the tapping is easy, as fast and as expressive as possible. The main inspiration for all the sticks is the freehands technique that I discovered on my guitar in 1969. Well, we won't go through all that. Yeah, and uh, Dan took that picture, for those yeah. of you guys wondering. That's stick 101, that's the first stick above L.A., sort of, yeah. The sword raised above to go down and conquer. I'm, I'm looking go, at the time here again. Goes, how's the time? Yeah, we're we're right up against it. Um, let let's get some questions going here, though. I know Matt's got a good question. Back to the hill. Oops, sorry. So yeah, so I want to turn it over to you guys and and maybe start with you, Matt, if you got uh, a question for for Dan. Uh, sure, I had a couple actually, but um, well, I guess one is how much money. Are you anticipating the documentary to cost the finished product? And uh, I guess are you looking to do sort of a version A or B? It sounded like you were hinting on that a little bit too. Maybe one's an Emmett Doc, maybe another one's the really um, sort of large, could be you know, fourteen-hour documentary set or something like that on the Chapman stick. So at least you get if you have one hundred and seventy hours of material, it's got to be very difficult to try to whittle down, you know, and choose from your favorites. 
Yeah, well, a lot of that is concert footage, and so uh, I'm not really I'm not making a concert film, uh, but there is a lot of playing to it. And as far as your question toward price, you know, that is kind of a dilemma to me. I I'm not sure. I I've been working on this on my own. I I put on my own time into it, and so I have not put together this important budget that you need to just to go after these funders, uh, and and that is uh, you know one of the shortcomings that that, uh, that I need to overcome. I do need uh, there. There's a lot of things I'd like to do. Uh, the producers I talked with suggested that I expand the documentary to make it about the stick instead of about Emmett. Uh, although, of course, if it's about the stick, then no doubt it's about Emmett. But their point is that it's very difficult to introduce two unique things to the audience, to your audience, that, uh, you know, for instance, if you're doing a documentary about Thomas Edison, everybody will assume and they know what he accomplished and what he did. But uh, to, to do something about uh, you first have to introduce Emmett, and then you also have to do, introduce what he's done. So they they thought it'd be a lot easier to make it about the stick. Although that's not <laughs> that's not where I started. I I, I I am not affiliated with Stick Enterprises in a business way, except for you know doing some freelance jobs for them. Uh, and and I'm not uh, I I'm uh, I, I never set out to make a documentary. Uh, that's a promotional documentary. This yeah. is uh, I'm I'm looking to make something that's poetic and artistic and truthful, you know, that, that documents uh, a history. Russell, you got uh, a question there to throw it, Dan? Yeah, I was just thinking of another one, but I'll go to the one I wrote. And I was just wondering, Dan, what what's the goal for the end product? A movie in theaters, uh, something to be sold to like a PBS that they would show, or directly to a DVD sales? No, it's uh, it's the I have the highest ambition for it, and I I think I have a story that has uh, this archetypal uh, strength that will appeal to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's up to me to figure out how to tell it in an emotional way, and this is where uh, I'm at right now is trying to figure out how to tell an emotional story because it's you, you, you don't have a movie unless you have emotion yeah. mm -hmm. and and I know that there's emotion there and there's uh, a lot of um, struggle that Emmett went through there's a lot of pain too and these things I haven't even uh, started to express and started to work with and and that that I need to do and I will do but it's uh, it's challenging, especially in the the Great Recession that we just had. You know, I started out very idealistically and uh, spent all my extra time doing this, but you know, lately all my extra time is just devoted to making to survival. Right. When, when you talk about the emotional side of it, I was thinking about uh, how, how they told you to make it more about the stick and not about uh, Emmett. And what I was thinking is to market it. To, you don't have to market it to stick players. Everybody's going to watch it. And is going to love it. Yeah, no doubt. But, but if you can touch on people, their creative sense that this man had a vision, this man, you know, carried out his vision to the point of making a living on it, then you're going to get people that are musicians or other type of artists or maybe even people looking that, that have a dream of any kind of business. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking about when they were talking about you shifting, uh, or shifting away from the man to the to the to the product. Uh, all those things are important, but just for a sales point of view, the emotional element to touch on everybody's desire to get their art out there, to be known, to be seen, to have it realized, and oh my God, to make a living doing it, you know, that would just, that would touch on even a wider audience. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Russell. It's the real American success story. You know, he's really, he's really created his dream and has, has made a living. Right, and, yeah, and success with art. Yeah. Art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And without compromise, really. Without compromising his original vision. Just expanding true. it. True. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, and how, how to say that is uh, 
how to how to form the story and make it uh, accessible and also make it uh, bring out the emotions. Uh, so far, I have a lot of interviews, a lot of music, and I need to really work with somebody like a, a really good editor or producer uh, to to craft uh, a narrative, yeah. a story that that uh, out of out of the real. It's not like making something up. It's the real story, but how to craft it in an emotional way. Yeah. Yeah. There, and there's this underlying story, too, which I, you, you haven't really touched on yet, and that's the story of you and your brother. You know, and you're, you're telling your brother's story. You know, I think right. there's, I think there's a, a, a thread there as well that, that resonates with me whenever I, I look at your work and talk with you about your work. Right. Let me show you one little picture that I wanted to share. Hang on one sec. Which is, uh, it shows you uh, where we're at. I mean, that's me, and that's Emmett. <laughs> I was like a one-year-old kid, and, you know, he's this older guy. He's like 15 years old, and I've always looked up to him. I mean, yeah. he's he's been, uh, it's kind of weird because I have a, uh, I'm the youngest kid in a, an older family, and uh it, it's he's almost like a father figure, but he is my brother. Yeah. Well, so I, I wanted to add something here. Uh, so joining us in the in the meeting here was a uh, Dean Pascarella, who's a, a fantastic stick player up in. Hey, Dean. Yeah, but in Northern Cal, his mic may or may not be working. So he's, but he had a a question, Jim. Yep. Go ahead. It's in the chat there. Oh, okay. Is, are you? Can you? Are you working, Dean? Yeah. So it says, uh, "How does Emmett feel about the documentary?" Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I know he's he's proud and he's moved and and uh, grateful for my attention. And but uh, you know, you Emmett is a tough subject. He's uh, he's not a self promotional type of guy. He, he doesn't go out and try to push himself, uh, uh, and, and he's not somebody who is actively, he didn't, he didn't want, he didn't, he wasn't the one who, who wanted to make this documentary. I was. And, and so he's not a, uh, he's, he's not an uncooperative subject, but he cooperates. Uh, he's just not, uh, uh, a big creative part of the story himself, you know, he, he is the story. So um, that's a good question. Thank you. How's our how's our time, Gene? Well, I, I think we're good for time. Um, I, I can. Uh, I, I suppose I was going to just add one little thing, and that was. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm when, good. And it, when Emmett, <laughs> one of my favorite moments at the Freehands Academy from 2013 was when we were setting up for this. So here we are at the American Jewish University. It's this 27-acre, massive, gorgeous facility. They've got a state-of-the-art library, whatever that is, um, and it's it's just it's beautiful. And it's, it's plush carpets and it's big, like like beautiful new. All the wood is new and it's just. It's, it's lush and there's big comfy couches and fancy chairs and and then and where we had the concert was actually there was this sliding glass door and so basically where we were located um, you know we had the ba like so there's the back line figure here's the back line the back line your, your your back is right up against the back of the library and behind you is this huge glass window that slides open and you can go into the library so we're we're flush up against the back of the library we're setting up and we're getting things ready you know and Dan and I have had this, you know, uh, wine and roses kind of relationship, and Dan was one of the first people involved with the Freehands Academy. He came down and looked at the campus with me two times. I didn't even see Emmett, you know. Emmett's too busy making sticks, right? So Dan's down there, he's checking it out, and we go and get lunch, and we're, you know, we go back down, and we talk to this cat, Rusty, who's setting it up, and, um, you know, it came down to it, and so the, the, we had the first day and the second day, and then it was the gig day. It was Saturday, and, and, and this is taking me a long while to set up, but just this <laughs> is the kind of relationship that Dan and Emmett have. 
And, uh, and, and I thought this was such a cool moment, being a younger brother myself, and just, like, adoring my older brother and, like, depending on him. And, and, yeah, he, he, Emmett saved the day. He did save the day. But it was how he did it that was so fucking cool. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was done, like, I don't even, okay, so, so we're, we're getting ready to, to, to set up for the movie, and now there's a problem because, you know, if you want to show a movie, what do you got to have? The absence of light, right? Because you want the movie, you don't want, it, like, the light to diffuse. And so we can't get this light turned off, okay? Now, it was, it was my, my worst nightmare. And, and okay, Dan seems like a nice guy, and Dan looks exactly like he does when he's angry, and he just was, he's just like, I'm very disappointed. <laughs> you cannot imagine my disappointment. You know what? I don't think I want to do this. And I was like, on my, I don't know if you recall this, Dan. I don't know if you recall. Oh, yeah. I How got down I forget? on my hands and knees and begged you. <laughs> I begged you. I was like, Dan, no, I, I'm I on my hands and knees. I wasn't going to participate. You know, unfortunately, some somehow we were we were at well, we were at a, a Jewish facility, and they were not able to work on the Sabbath, right? I mean, yeah. that's well, that's re reasonable. But, but but there was supposed to be someone there who could turn off the right. lights. It, it had for, nothing for to do screening. with Shabbos. It had like let's leave the Jews out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was I was trying there. to understand uh, and, yeah. and take it philosophically. But the problem is, is that if you had those lights on, the the whole screen is washed out, and it was like, you know, I don't even want to be there to introduce it. I'll let the film roll if because I promised it was there. But I I mean, I feel so humiliated that I didn't want to be a part of it. Right. And, and that was that was hard for me because we had worked so hard for this one moment, and now it was like everyone had done their part, and we'd had Alfonso Johnson on campus, and Greg Howard's freaking out, showing us all these techniques, and here's Kevin Keith playing funky music, and and this is in between sets, so mm -hmm. like we've played the first set, and now we're going to show the movie, so it's like this is just like oh man, this is just like that creamy center, we're waiting for the movie, and we're all fine, you know, like and um, Emmett. You know, after, at the beginning, even before we started the first concert, what Emmett does is he just doesn't make any fuss about it. He grabs, like, a chair, stands on top of it, and starts unscrewing the frickin' light. <laughs> he just unscrews the light. Yeah. He's, like, there. Right. Yeah, Yeah. nobody <laughs> wanted to bridge that gap because everybody was afraid to offend Right. There was the, this whole political thing, and I was like, well, now, I, I went back to Rusty and, like, hey, can we please... Can we please figure out how to turn the light switch off? Like I, I was in my car uh, decompressing. <laughs> how I, do I you went, not know how to turn a light switch off? And they went back and forth, and then it was like, right. well, your audiovisual guy didn't show up. So Emmett stands up on a chair, turns the light. He's like, oh, here, look, Gene. Yeah, it was neon lights, so, so right. uh, fluorescent lights. It about 45 degrees, and then it goes off. And, and so I was like, so then all of a sudden, everyone's jumping up on chairs, turning off the lights, and it was like dark. That's <laughs> awesome. And it was like, Emmett Chapman, you know, like, we'll find the show. And I remember him, like, I was like, Emmett, I'm, I'm really glad that you did that. And he's like, Gene, sometimes you just have to forget the politics. Once again, he's my hero. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. That, was, that was how he said it. And, uh, and, I, and that was my favorite moment at the Freehands Academy because it was just like, it was just, it was just like, clear away, clear away, clear away. The, the, what is the problem? The problem is the light. Turn off the light. Switch won't work. Move Very the light. Basic. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, Gene, I'm looking up at the time, and I'm seeing that we've gone a little bit over. I'm happy to chat all day, though. This is uh, this has been by far been the highlight of my, my last week, at least, if not uh, the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would have to agree. And uh, if you guys don't know much about Jim Riley, you will. You will, Jim's. I, I, we're going to try and, and last up Jim for one of our um, when Canada takes over the Freehands Academy. Yeah, yeah let me just say that uh, my uh, the the spark of inspiration for me to make this documentary was uh, Jim. That uh, hearing that he was writing a biography about Emmett and. Uh, I, I, it inspired me to do this documentary and use the skills that I have to be able to uh, work on it. I was I was hoping he would be able to be an active collaborator in the process. Uh, yeah. 
but uh, he's up in Canada right now. Yeah, and, time and time and distance has has made that tricky, but not impossible. You know, yeah. I'm sure we can. I, I would I would love to to be a part of that, and I, you know, we've talked about that lots too. So hopefully, we can make that happen too. That'd be yeah. Fun. Cool. All yeah. right. Well, J Jim, you want to see us out? Yeah, I'll sign off. Um, first of all, huge thanks, Gene, to you and and the Freehands Academy and the work you're doing down there. Um, it's 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 a wonderful community that we've got here, uh, and and what you're doing is just a, a really um, wonderful way to honor that and enrich um, enrich what we're what we're all trying to do. It really yeah. speaks it speaks to the whole um, uh, bravo you know, the whole heart of of who stick players are as people. It's you know the the egos are at the door and we get together and we we make our lives better. And yeah, and it's so and it's got the right name. That. Free hands. Yeah. Yeah, in all the sense. <laughs> so uh, I'll officially thank Dan for his uh, his time today and his insight and wish him the best of luck. And once again... I'll need I'll, it. Yeah, offer uh, my services, and I'm sure you've got hundreds of other people out there that would be happy to, to offer their services to you as well, um, as as needed, I'm sure. And, uh, and thank you, thank Free Hands, and maybe officially sign off March 14th, 2014's Free Hands Friday. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. All. Bye, guys.